It's my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Lori Isom, who many of you know. Dr. Isom is the chair of pharmacology. And um, I was talking to her, because I was doing the math as to how many faculty hires she has had since becoming chair four years ago. Three years ago. Three years ago. And you want to take a guess? She's had 12 faculty members, 12 new faculty members uh, in the last three years. So she really has a lot of insight from a department chair's perspective uh, as to uh, what departments look for in a new faculty hire. Uh, how, do, how, does, um, how do department chairs interact with leadership, such as the dean's office, and how is the charge given to a search committee uh, to look at new candidates who would be good colleagues in uh, a thriving department like pharmacology. Uh, Laurie also has had many other leadership roles, um, including being chair of the PIPS program for a number of years, director of the PIPS program for a number of years, and assistant dean for recruitment um, uh, in the PIPS program also for a number of years. So she has seen uh, the university from many different lenses, and she also has a very active lab, so she is a researcher. Uh, um, so I'm really, really thankful that you could take time, because it was hard to find a one hour slot that fit. Uh, everybody's schedules. I'm very grateful that we could find this time and uh, be sure you're asking all your good questions because she's running off to another important meeting right after this. So we are lucky to have her. Um, our moderator today is a postdoc, uh, Kaylee Steen uh, from Pierre Colomb's lab uh, in CDB. And Kaylee uh, has been a postdoc for a year. She came from the University of Minnesota and she has won a number of awards in leadership and in teaching. And her passion is pedagogy and education. Um, and she is in Pierre Colomb's lab uh, in CDB. So it will be Kaylee and Laurie's show from now on. So I'm going to see you in the front. If anybody comes in the back, just push them up. <laughs> yes, it's not scary. Yeah. yeah. Can everybody hear me OK? I lost my voice a couple of days ago, so I'm still a little raspy. OK, I'm sorry about that. Um, so I have a couple of just kind of leading questions that I thought we could start off with and let Lori kind of give her two cents and then we can open it up. Um, so the first one is, um, as a department chair, what is your primary role, particularly with regards to with the dean or other various leadership in the, in the institution, um, the faculty as well as the, the perspective? Uh, faculty that you're you're hiring. Okay, so great question. So hi everybody, and people I don't know, hello, and uh, people I do know, hello. Um, so a chair is the interface between the faculty and the administration and the dean's office. Okay, and then the outer, the greater university. So we have a group of basic science chairs here. I think it's the only medical school in the world that has this. It's called the Endowment for Basic Sciences, or the EBS. I'm a chair of that. And that's, we get together and act as one to create policy. We work together to do joint recruitments um, and to help with graduate education, which is really important. And we have an endowment that we spend. And so one of my primary roles as a chair of the EBS is I meet directly with Marshall Runge all the time to help <coughs> formulate policy. So right now we're writing a space policy for the medical school, so I'm able to do that. So it's really great for me to know these things and then convey them to our to my faculty and to my staff. And so then when in, in hiring, uh, as a new chair, how it works here at least, and remember, if you've seen one academic medical center, you've seen one academic medical center. <laughs> and that's really true. So when you're out in the job market, you've got to find out. You've got to do your homework. And so how it happens here is that when I was hired as chair, Marshall Runge gave me a package of money, funds, and positions to hire. Okay, so they gave me, when I was interim chair for a year, I had two positions and a bunch of money, and then when I became chair chair, I was given 10 positions and money. But I also have brokered that, I've made my money go farther by doing joint recruitments with some clinical departments and other departments, which I think is really key. So I have been able to hire pretty autonomously with my faculty, and then at the end we say, this is the person that we want, and before we give the final uh, offer letter. But it's really our decision in the, in the department. But I always talk to my chair colleagues in the EBS, 
and my clinical chair colleagues to get their opinion because I'd like to know what they think and I have uh, people outside of our department on the search committees to get an outside opinion and they come to the seminars and the chalk talks and I really take their their um, opinion seriously because one you know, I'm a new chair and I it's good to get that that input so it, it's a collaborative effort but uh, from I think here in Michigan the chairs have a lot of autonomy in hiring. Yes. And so then the second question, <clears throat> when you know you have money to hire a new faculty or maybe a, several faculty yes. um, to the point of when, in which a job would be offered and then they would start in lab, what is the timeline uh, like that typically? It's a long time. Ac uh, academic hiring uh, works on a, on a glacial case. <clears throat> So if, for instance, if you're looking at a job in industry, they want you yesterday, they do very fast decision making. In academic hiring, let's, let's think about this. So we recently um, hired two new assistant professors in our cancer pharmacology search. Carol Perrant is the chair of that search, and we launched it uh, almost a year ago. Okay. So it takes a long time because you bring people in for interviews. They're each here at least two days, sometimes longer. We interviewed nine candidates. That takes a long time, a lot of work. And then you bring people back for second visits. And then sometimes if there's a spousal, uh, you know, a significant other second body issue, right, you may need to find a position for that person. So. The word go to bringing somebody in can take about 18 months. So, you know, you don't, that means if you have a personal deadline, you have to start, you have to calculate backwards. Right? Mm -hmm. it takes a long time. And I guess just kind of related to that, because there was a question that um, somebody uh, posted Is there a typical um, kind of like cycle of when people should be looking for? job postings? Yeah, I, well, so the bet, the most jobs are posted in, on online on science careers, right, and nature in September of every year. But that doesn't mean that's the only time. So we have launched searches uh, completely off that cycle. There are a number of schools that really need to go along the academic year, and they really have heavy teaching loads, and so they want to, to time their search so they've got somebody on board by the next academic year. So they want somebody in the next summer, so they start in September. So if you're looking, that that's the gold mine right there. But don't think that's the only thing. Thank you. So I have a whole list of questions here that you all submitted, but I think I'll open it up to the floor if anyone has any burning questions. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk more about that two-body problem. Sure. I think it's something that a lot of the staffs are facing as they transition into that faculty position. But not, not a lot of us hear about how those decisions are made, how easy they're made, and, and what's the best way to set up that for success. Yes. So my husband and I are both scientists. And we came here to the University of Michigan, and we did have to broker that. So I have personal experience and then of the people that we um, have hired. So. The, the person that gets asked to come for the interview, okay, is, is treated as an autonomous individual, right? So, and it is truly not legal for us, for me, to ask you coming in, do you have a spouse? Do you have children? Oh, right, because you need to be treated as an individual. But it doesn't hurt you to say it, okay? to let people know right on the, on the front end, and I really appreciate it when a candidate says to me, here are the considerations that I have. And I, I always ask at the interview, so the way we set up the interviews um, yeah, in our department is I'm the last person they see before they get on the airplane. So they have given a seminar, they've given a chalk talk, they've seen all the faculty, met with students, all been all over the university, then they meet with me for at least an hour and sometimes two, so if we need to look at space and things. So one of the things I say is, are there any special considerations that I need to be aware of for this recruitment to be successful? If they ask that, that's your time 
if they don't ask that, that's your time. You need to say it. You need to say, these are the considerations that I have, especially if your spouse is a scientist and is looking for an academic um, position or an industry position nearby. We have an office in the office of the provost for spousal recruitment. And so we have a whole body of people that we can mobilize to help with that recruitment. But if we don't know it until the end, that's how we've lost people. Is that all of a sudden somebody will say on the second interview or, or after that, you give them an offer, and oh yeah, I have a spouse that I need to find a job for. And sometimes that doesn't work. So the earlier you can ask, the better. Okay. Well, you're all sleeping. Yes. Yeah. Um, what are uh, some of the most outstanding qualities that you look for in a in a job candidate? It's <clears throat> a great question. So we want somebody who's a stellar scientist, who is uh, a great communicator, who is so you can tell they're going to be a great teacher. You can tell that they have a rapport with trainees, okay? And that they have a fit for our department. That's really important, and it's difficult to define, okay? So every department has a personality. Every institution has a personality. And there is a Michigan way. There's, there's something about Michigan and about people's personalities and how they interact with with uh, trainees and how they care about their community and their environment and that we're looking for. So, um, y yes, it, this, is, this is a difficult thing to nail down. So, but what you wanna do in preparation is of course you wanna have a lot of first author papers, okay? And don't worry so much that they're not in science and nature and cell and neuron, okay? They need to be high impact papers, but don't worry so much about where they are in that top tier. Just make sure that you're showing your productivity and that you have, that you can show that you can conduct an independent research program and you have ideas that will make you independent from your mentor. Those, that's really what's gonna be important on the, the, on the face value of your interview. But then, how, when you give that seminar, your, how are you gonna be as a teacher? So can you convey and communicate your research and the impact of your research to non-experts in your field? Or are you starting out speaking in shorthand in the very first slide, right? So are you trying to can give a lab meeting to your group of specialists, right? So how does this person communicate? And then how would this person collaborate with different people in our department. So that is on you to do some homework and figure out who's there. And hopefully you're giving a seminar after you've met with some people, so you can kind of get a feeling of the ground, of what, they're, what they need. And then in public, you want to address that, okay? So that's the face value. We're looking for fit. Uh, we're looking for a real, uh, an impactful uh, research program and then the potential for that person to split off an independent research program. And then we have informal meetings with students, with trainees, and every one of those people I want a written report from. How did that person interact with you? How did that person treat you? You know, how you, uh, uh, a uh, gauge of your character is how you treat the waiter, right? How do you treat students? And when there are no faculty in the room, right? And how do you conduct yourself? in social situations. All those things come to bear on, for me at least, about fit. So I, th I think that fit, the fit part is probably the biggest part. Because if you get an interview to the University of Michigan, you, your CV looks pretty darn good, right? You know this already. But then you come in here and how does that person look? Does, it, does, that, does that person match the piece of paper? That was one of the questions. It sounds oh, like you okay. exactly answered it. One of the things that, excuse me, us as postdocs don't get a lot of training in are these things like how to hire the right staff, how to manage a million dollar yes. account, how to do these things. So how do successful candidates either demonstrate their preparedness or their, their fast learning ability for those types of tasks? Well, okay, so, so an easy and obvious answer is if you have a K99, that kind of tells a lot about you. But not everybody has K99, right? And so, uh, 
if you are working in your laboratory and you take it on a leadership role, okay? So I, what I do in my lab is that postdocs and junior faculty, they, they become lieutenants in the lab, right? They, they run certain parts of the lab, and they help with the financial planning. And it, so if you do that, there's evidence of it, and then ask your mentor to write that in that letter. And then talk about it when you're with the chair. That's really, really important. Um, also, if you're able, to participate in interviews and go to chalk talks. I don't know if your department lets you do it. I've opened it up to postdocs because I think that's the most important career development contribution I can make to our postdocs because that's a black box. That is on the job training, trial by fire, on the most important day of your life, there you are and you've never done it before. So if you can participate in that, then that will really help you, okay? Yeah. So considering the I guess widespread lack of communication about expectations for interviews. What are some of the most common mistakes that people are falling into because they didn't know or they had no idea going in and people or people thought, oh this is obvious, why do I need to tell somebody about this ahead of time? Yes. Exactly. So that's the problem. So um, if you have the opportunity to give multiple interviews, if you have a number of invitations, try and uh, schedule them so the one you want least is the one you go to first. <laughs> so you can make, honestly, you need to practice. It's like, this is like uh, graduate student interviews, right? So, um, so okay, uh, when you give your seminar, the first, usually when you go, and in our department, you give the seminar the first day, and then the second day you give a chalk talk. Okay, so you want to reserve certain things for those events, but you also want to convey as much information in each one because there may be somebody who doesn't make it to the next day. Okay, so really good advice that I got when I was on the job market, well, here, right, this, um, is start your seminar by engaging your audience. So you don't want to start your seminar with a very specialized slide, right? You want to start. Like for me, we study pediatric epilepsy. Well, I, I talk about what happens to patients so I can draw in everybody in that room because everybody can relate to that, okay? So you haven't put off anybody in that room. You've drawn them in and you've also demonstrated how well you communicate. And then you talk about your work, but we have to remember at the end, this is a job talk, people wanna know what you're going to do. So even though you're gonna spend the whole next hour and the next day in your chalk talk talking about that, put some slides in at the end. Here is where I want to go, so time it. So you're finished with all your beautiful, complicated stuff that you're publishing now with your PI, you know, at like the 40 minute mark or so. And then spend 10 minutes or so talking about where you're going, and then you've done some homework before this, and you can even say, I know that this would fit in really well here in this program, in, in your cancer pharmacology program, and I know I could, I could collaborate with this person. And, and show that you've really thought about it, okay? The other thing that people make all the time is they don't think about timing and they don't practice. Because things happen in seminars. And for instance, when we were still all on Michigan time, right? I got rid of Michigan time on January 1st because our candidates were going down in flames over this. They would come in, they'd come in this room, they're standing here at 12 o'clock and there's nobody in here. And the look on their face is like, <laughs> and then, I, then we remind them that we start at 10 after. And then the look on their face is, because now they've lost 10 minutes of this perfectly timed uh, presentation. So find out and, and give some leeway. Be ready to be flexible, things that you can do. And then say, you know, something happens to your computer and you're, you know, right, there's a little bit of time. So just, you gotta learn to roll with it and be flexible and get all that information in, including where you're going and what you're doing, in about 45 minutes, okay? And in some places, like Michigan Pharmacology, People interrupt you in the middle of the seminar and ask really important questions, and then you are really, you can see that on their face because, okay, I know that at 12.15 I should be saying this line, and I'm not, and it throws them. And so that working with it is really important in time. And then in the next day, in Chalk Talks, most people in this room, most people that come for these interviews have never given a Chalk Talk in their lives unless 
were the, you know, the 10th interview they've had. And so they give a chalk talk, they bet an hour, and they try and talk about every single experiment they are ever, ever, ever gonna do. And it gets completely overwhelming to everybody. Nobody understands what they're talking about. Okay, and then they leave that room with, everybody's got a bad taste, like this person is so scattered that she doesn't know what she's talking about. But you really do, but you, you didn't plan that out well enough um, to convey it. So going to as many of those events that other people give ahead of time is essential. Would you suggest a mock chalk talk yes. before? Yes. If you can't go to and uh, see them, mm -hmm. even if you can't actually, get a bunch of faculty where you live and you're and other postdocs and people that can be really harsh, right? <laughs> and say, be harsh and get up because it's better, you know, toast them at home, right? And then and then go off and be really stellar. Because that's where people over and over and over again fall down at Zen at Chalk Talk. They give a beautiful seminar. And then they go into the Chalk Talk and fall on their faces. And, and so, here's, a, here's what I ask. There's a person that's coming from a great big Howard Hughes lab. There are 45 postdocs in there, right? They have technicians, they can order anything, they can spend money like it's water, and they give a beautiful presentation. How much of that work was that, did that person do? That's hard to find out. And so what I want to know is on the next day in the Chalk Talk, how they can stand on their own two feet and talk about the work and make plans. And sometimes you can't, that's where you see it. If somebody coming from a big lab that just, you could just, you just check boxes, right? And order stuff and, and have everybody helping you. But then the ability to start on your own when you wake up that day, I'll never forget this. You go into your lab, there's an empty office, right? You look out, and there's this big empty space. I didn't even have pipe tips. I didn't have, I mean, I didn't know what I was, and so, but you have to know what to do that day, and there are a lot of people that can't do that. Well, yes. So this is just a clarifying question. I'm in the social sciences, okay. and um, we don't usually do a seminar and a job talk. Can you clarify what a seminar is? Oh, yeah. a job talk. Okay. So the seminar is your, you're talking about your work. You are talking about the background. You're talking about what you did, your, your papers, right, your work, and what it means. Okay? That's what that is. And then the job talk is, if you were going to submit an R01 tomorrow, what would it be? What would be your hypothesis? What would be your aims? What experiments would you do, right? What preliminary data do you have? And where do you see the, the compounds, right? Do you, can you recognize them? And then what kind of collaboration would you require to get that? And what kind of expertise or core facilities or whatever it is you need to be successful, okay? Thank you. Yeah. Um, for the people who aren't, aren't social butterflies, like talking one on one with the professors, like what things should we be bringing up that maybe we're not thinking of, or what things should we steer where, away from that we may not realize that shouldn't be in that sort of conversation here, interviewing oh. either with you as a department chair or with the individual members of the department. Yeah, so you all know this, right? So you go on a job talk, interview, and you're gonna spend most of the day going from office to office, meeting the faculty and talking to them. Okay, so you need to have, if you haven't already given your seminar, because you probably have, and sometimes you're not, you haven't, you would need to have a condensed version of your seminar in your head that you can talk about, right, in a way that is understandable by a scientist not in your field, so you have to be ready to talk about that. It's a really good idea before you go, and this is obvious when people don't do it, because you're going to get a schedule before you land, right? Look up those people. Find out what they do. Say something about it. Say, I read your paper on Campanis too. Wow, that was really cool. And I see that we, there's a potential collaboration here, okay? So showing an interest in that particular faculty member and the school, that's really key. Mm -hmm. ask, ask that person about their own research, right? Ask a question. Remember graduate school. <coughs> this is very similar. 
engage that person. And there's no better way to engage a person than to ask them about themselves. <laughs> right? Isn't that true? Yes. Ask them about their research and ask about how you could collaborate. And if you have some idea going in, that's really good. You can make a suggestion and let them go with it. Right? And, and then get people, just get people talking. And then they will ask you questions. So, yeah. The worst thing, though, is, and you know this from graduate school interviews, as you go into somebody's office and you can't think of stuff to talk about. You all remember this, right? Hmm. Hmm. What should we talk about? And there are, you're going to go into faculty offices of those people aren't so good at, at engaging. They're not social butterflies either. So then it's up to you. You've got to carry the day. So be prepared with some questions and comments. Okay? Yeah. Have you been involved with the clinical faculty hiring and what that process is like? I have. I have. So I was co chair of the search committee that hired our new chair of um, OBGYN. Okay, so I participated in all those interviews. And um, that has much different emphasis. I mean, there is a research, a scientific uh, emphasis, at least at the University of Michigan, because we really want physician scientists, but much more emphasis on uh, clinical care, on management of clinical care, on management of uh, income, right, and, and good stewardship of income, um, about ethics, um, about dealing with political climate, you know, that kind of thing. How, how would you, especially something like OBGYN, which is just pretty hot with political uh, implications. So that, and then uh, the, I guess that actually that the fit and how you would interact with the other clinical chairs and the clinical mission is really, so it's the same, but in a different setting, right? It's, it's the fit. And then we do ask a lot of science, but it's much more on how you deal with problems running a big clinical enterprise that includes hospitalization and outpatient, things like that. Yes? Um, I was wondering how much of a role do you, like the candidates' personal connections or maybe their advisor's connections play in like the application oh. to interview? A lot, a lot. So, um, because uh, it's a small world, mm -hmm. science is a small world. And so especially if we're hiring in an area, well, I try to set the chair of the search committee as somebody who's really intimately involved in that scientific area and therefore knows all the players, okay? And we don't always, well, gosh, I, it's rare that you hire somebody that just answered an ad in print, right? It's somebody that you know. So you call the leaders in the field and you say, who are your new postdocs coming out? And who are your best people? And that's how you, how you get them. And then that personal connection between the PIs helps that candidate to really feel wanted and at, at home mm -hmm. and a fit. So there is a huge amount of um, personal connection and in fact before we invite anybody we make a lot of phone calls we do due diligence so we we call around and we people know everybody knows everybody right in science and so you, you call and ask and, and figure out is this really a good candidate yeah we get a lot of questions about cvs cover letters research yeah. statements um, and i know those are each kind of their own um, yeah. thing but yeah it was um a common theme was what is either one trait that you look at or something that can make, let's start with the CV, something that will make a candidate really stand out. Yeah. So you want to, so I open it up and I look at their papers. I look at their first author papers. I look at where they are, where they went, where they're published, um, and what they did, not only in their postdoc, but their before that, right, and their, their graduate career. And so how productive is this person? Then I look at their uh, grant funding, and I, all of you who have taken my grant writing course know this, is that getting grant funding as a student or a postdoc is not only a great thing because you, you uh, pay for things and your PI is happy, but it's evidence of fundability. 
Okay, so if a person has F31s and F32s or AHA funding, and you want to know that because that success breeds success. That's what I'm looking for. And if you've got a K99, great, that's icing on the cake. Not everybody has that, it's fine. Um, actually, a brand new hire that's coming in next week has his own R01. Got it as a trainee. It's, it's incredible. So, but I look at fun, funding. I then I look at um, how, what kind of meetings you are going to and presenting your work. So, and if, if there are things like Gordon conferences or things like, or Gordon research seminars, really you know, big meetings where it means something. That, that, because that is an indication of the impact of your work and the, the way your peers look at, at you. Okay, so, because we're, we're trying to find somebody that can be independent and impactful all by themselves. So we look at that and then, um, uh, what else on there? Service. At, at Michigan, we really care about people that care about other people and their community and their environment. And so people list things like, you know, service to national organizations or local organizations. That's really, I think it's really great. How much importance would you give to all the collaborative work that the candidate has done, and how would you recommend to emphasize that work? Because yes. it's kind of hard to emphasize it. It's hard to emphasize that. So, um, collaborative work is really, really important because that's how science is done. Um, and that indicates that you're going to be a good collaborator here. Okay? So, you got to have a balance of first author work and collaborative work. And then I like it. Um, so, I'm on executive committee, and actually, that's where I'm going after this meeting. But uh, when you go up for promotion, you include something called talking points or bibliographic notes. And it's a one pager where you we ask faculty to choose their five, what they think are their most impactful papers, and write a paragraph about it. This, this work is important because, and written for a non-expert audience, and my role in this was this, okay? Especially if you're working on a team science project, I, my work was really important because I did this. This was my role. And then ask your boss, your PI, in his or her letter of recommendation to talk about that and to set it off in a separate paragraph. Yes, she was in the, in the alphabet soup in this big uh, consortium, but we couldn't have done it without her because she had this rule. That's really key because if, that, if you have a bunch of those collaborative papers, team science papers, without an explanation, it's not gonna fly very well because the cultures at medical schools are still looking for first author papers. So you have to get around them, okay? I think there's another hand up. Yeah. yeah. So I know papers that already are out are best, but yeah. say if you're just having you know, bad timing and mm -hmm. you've submitted papers um, and you put them on bioarchive, is that still better than not sending that bioarchive information with it or should it just not be there? I don't know. I, 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 I don't know how I feel about bioarchive, but it, on your CV that you send out, just put submitted in preparation, list those, okay? And then say, if you'd like a preprint, I can, I can give it to you, or it is on BioArchive and you can look at it, okay? So, but just, but list them. So when you are, so we're putting together all the appointment packages now that are going to the, to the dean and the provost, and you can't, you're not allowed to put papers that aren't published on there, mm -hmm. but you can when you're applying on your, your first go around. Just say that they're coming. Yeah. Uh, as an interviewing candidate, what are red flags that the candidate should be looking for for the institution? Oh, that you're looking for? Yes. Okay. How I happy? Sort of a difficult question, yeah. but no, this is really, really important because there are places that just throw you in the shark tank, and you need to look for that. Okay. So, for instance, at Michigan in Michigan Pharmacology, okay, on the first day you're going to get a launch committee that is with a trained uh, facilitator by the NSF launch committee, right, whatever that we call it. And those people are going to shepherd you through your first year. It's like having a thesis committee for junior faculty member. That is really important. You're going to have assigned mentors from the department. You are going to have, your chair is going to make it very, very clear that your success is her success. OK? 
okay? That you're not, they're not hiring five people for the same one tenure line. That happens, right? That they hired a bunch of people and only, only one of them is going to get tenure. And what does that set up? What is, that, that sets up a war on the first day. So you want to talk to the other assistant professors and people that have recently been promoted, people who have been successful. What are their thoughts about this? How was their, um, uh, their experience? And then are people staying? Or are they getting tenure and leaving as fast as they can go, right? Um, what kind of um, bridging support and um, uh, support, so you run out of your startup and you haven't gotten your R01 yet? What happens? Okay, who's, who's there to help you? And what kind of space do people have? And um, are they getting graduate students? Talk to, you're gonna have lunch with the graduate students and postdocs hopefully, ask them. What's it like here? They, you will get so much truth out of those. <laughs> but ask that question and find. And the, but at the same time, because I've heard my graduate students talk about this, that um, because they want to be, they would be open with this candidate. But the candidate's not open. So you need to have give and take with them because uh, talk about your philosophy for mentoring and make it really clear that this is really important to you. And they will respond and talk about the climate and the department. Climate is the most important thing that you can get when you're somewhere because you got to get up every day and go there for the hopefully the you know rest of your career but who knows when um, you're looking as a department or on a search committee have you experienced that there are certain trends whether it's like biological questions that are being asked or certain techniques that people are using that are hot that you really want um, what's kind of in the Scientifically speaking, what's, what's on the forefront of the faculty's yeah. minds? So in our recent cancer pharmacology search, I wanted a T-cell immunologist. We got one um, there, but that's really, uh, that's a big deal, right? So, because I'm thinking about us going forward and the whole department being impactful and then the um, interactions with the clinical department. So what my philosophy is that all of my new assistant professors coming in should have at least a drive coming in the clinical department that is related to their research, because what does that do? That opens the door to all the clinical samples, the clinicians, the surgical samples, all that, all those things, and then the disease mechanisms that you may not have thought about. So, and you have to be careful of how trendy you are. I mean, because every year that's gonna change, right? right? So today, if you say, um, I'm a T-cell immunologist, I use CRISPR in induced pluripotent stem cells, there you go. How more hot can you be than that? But in a year, that's gonna change. So we're looking for people that are flexible and that can follow the science. So they're very, they have a high level of scientific curiosity and they're not married to any one technique because in five years that technique's not going to be there anymore and they need to follow it. So I'm not, I'm less um, uh, concerned with the, the, you know, the hottest mm -hmm. new thing. Yeah. Yeah. In the case of the T cell immunologist, did you advertise that specifically or explicitly? No. It was just kind of that was in there. Yeah. And I knew I'd get some because, yeah. you know, it's today. So we have a T cell immunologist and actually a B cell uh, person who works on pancreatic, which is really interesting. And I, but I, I really, we want people that can really uh, go with, uh, with disease mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How do you go about getting the dual appointments? Do you put it up front? Or do you? Is it something oh. that you offer the dual appointment yeah. that you mentioned? I do. Uh, so is it something that is offered by the department or something that you put forward that I wanna? I prefer to have a dual appointment in this department too, or so especially when there are two uh, offerings out that you feel like you're kind of fit for both of them. Right. Right. So here's what I do. So for an example. Um, a new faculty member I have coming in next month is a cardiovascular pharmacologist, electrophysiologist, um, working on stem cells. So when he, and if you, first I had people from the cardiovascular center, cardiac medicine, cardiac surgery on the search committee, okay? So they came to all the events, they heard him speak. And then I was able to call um, David Pinsky, who's head of cardiac medicine, and say, Dave, I'd really like to offer 
this, this new recruit a dry appointment in cardiac medicine? He said, absolutely, I would love to have him. And so that's what we did. And you just, you broker that, it's easier to broker that with the clinical chairs on the way in than later, okay? Because you want that in the initial appointment. And then that's also very tempting. That helps you to attract top candidates because they see immediately that clinical link that they're looking for, okay? So, and uh, one, you know, in, in cancer, in our cancer search, we don't, I don't know if they'd be better in hemoc or radoc or where, or pathology or whatever, so we wait until we see the person in the whole package and I invite certain clinicians to come and listen, and then they get excited and say, oh yeah, we really want to collaborate with this person. So we want to make this person, for example, our new person part of the, the um, pancreatic cancer group. So then that's a natural joint there. So it, it's really an individual thing, but I, we do it on the internet. But from a, the applicant side, should we, yeah. should we suggest that or should we avoid doing that? No, ask. Say, if, is there any possibility no. of me having at least a, a joint, a, a dry appointment, so no funding? Um, included with that, but part of that department because I really, really am interested in having access to clinicians. And I think that will be taken as a strength, but you have to feel that out, mm -hmm. you know, where you are. Okay. Could you speak a little bit about um, the negotiations, assuming you might get an offer after? Sure. What kinds of things should you ask for, should you not ask for? What, how hard do you push, because you might is yeah. that the chair or the department? Yeah, yeah. So what I do on the second visit, or sometimes on the first visit, if I'm really enthusiastic about this person, is I'll ask them to send me their startup needs, okay, their equipment list and what they see financially they're going to need. Okay? And, and that's an indication to me of really how, uh, I don't know, what good stewards they are, right? And if they're asking for the moon, that as an assistant professor, you've got that's a warning sign, right? So, but you have to be realistic. What is it going to take to be successful? So then you work with that, and then I put together an offer letter that has draft written across it. That is, um, and it says, I intend to offer you this position, and here is what I would like to offer you, and that has salary, startup, benefits, moving expenses, joint appointment if it's there. Um, what equipment we already have, what we can offer you, membership in the cancer center, all that stuff. Okay, and I say, please let's let's talk about this. I send it to them. They read it. We talk on the phone. They talk about things that they really feel they need. Um, sometimes we have to come to a you know a middle ground. One of the things that I can't go too far on because this public institution is salary because we, equity is really very very important. And then for assistant professors. I offer I start a, I, I offer a million dollar startup, okay? I, I do not want to have a situation where assistant professor A got a million dollars and assistant professor B got two, two million, right? Because people talk. It doesn't matter how secret you think this is and confidential, they talk to each other. And then you have haves and have nots in the department and that makes for bad blood. That's, that's not a good situation. So there are you know, little things. Um, so one of my assistant professors wanted to add a, uh, a CO2 uh, enclosure to one of our confocals. And so we pay for that, you know, that, an extra 100,000, something like that. We can do it, especially if it's, you're asking for specialized equipment that others in the department can use. And you can say that. I know that this group would really like to have this. And so I'd like to have this as part of my startup. Maybe we can add that. So, um, reasonable things, and, and when I can see that this person's being very reasonable, that's really good. Now, the thing you don't want to do is nickel and dime your chair and harp on it. Because I work with people that nothing is ever good enough. Okay, I, I'm giving you this million dollars, but okay, I want 25,000 more for this, and I want this. No, no, we're not going to do it, right? And what that tells me is something about how that person's going to act when they're a faculty member, right? So you have to be very careful to not push your chair over the edge. Because <laughs> I mean, these are really generous startup packages, and most places are like this. So you, and as a new assistant professor, you just have to be careful um, about the demands that you make. Okay? But at the same time, if it's not enough for you to be successful, you've got to speak up. Because if you're not successful, your chair's not going to be successful. So you've got to work together.
Okay, does that make sense? I have uh, two questions. So the number one is that uh, what do you think a project has been screwed by committee drafts? Uh, what? Say that again. If, uh, what do you think a, a project has been screwed up by a competition? Competitive. Like you got, you got scooped, I think. Oh, if you got scooped. Oh, so if you're a candidate and you're working on a project and you've been scooped, right? You know, it happens. Science, it, science happens, right? And uh, I'm sure that, that what you have to offer, you have something to offer that's a little bit different than that other paper. Very good. You may not be the first one, right? You may not make it to the big splash. But I am sure you have some data that are different than that big splash paper and that you can make a contribution. That doesn't bother me. If people are in competitive fields, and I, I completely understand that. So that doesn't bother me. Second question is that uh, in your department, uh, how to make sure this tenant uh, with uh, how many grants, how many papers? Uh, yeah. So. I'm very careful to say, to so not say. So could you repeat, I could oh, yes. repeat the question. What, what is required for tenure, right, as an assistant professor? And he asked how many grants, how many papers, how whatever. I'm very careful to never say you need this many grants and this many papers. Because what we're really looking for is impact. And in fact, I'm a member of the executive committee, and that's what we do. We evaluate all the tenure packages, and that's where I'm going after this. So, but what we look for is impact, and in, by that I mean, how your peers recognize what you do. So what's your age index? What are the measures of impact and other people citing your work? What is the, how many, are you being invited to give talks outside the university and at national and maybe international meetings? Or have you been asked to serve on an editorial board? Have you been asked to review NIH grants? Not that you're on a, a uh, permanent member of a study section, because as, as an assistant professor, that's way too much. But are you ad hoc uh, at NIH to help, or other places like NSF? Um, and you got to have, here, you have got to have um, R01 or R01-like funding, which means R, uh, NIH, NSF, or DOD. Okay, that really means that. So uh, su significant funding with indirect costs. Okay, so it's good, F foundations are great, but they're, in the end, it's really the federal funding. That, because um, uh, the, the stamp of approval from an NIH study section means a lot. Okay? That's also an indication of, of your impact. How many, you, know, you need to have a number of papers. I mean, you need to have like, I don't know, 20, 25 papers, something like that, when you go up for tenure, and you need to have funding, and then you need to have that outreach and you need to have some service, right, to, to the institution and to national organizations. And then we go out and we ask for external letters, right? So we're gonna have, I usually try and get 10 letters. So then, because people, they ignore you and you get, you need to have at least five, but I like to have about eight. And then what are, what's the opinion of, um, say, other city chairs, okay? Would, would this person be promoted at your institution? So I got very good advice when I was a brand new assistant professor, and that is to wake up that first day and assume you're getting tenure and act like it, right? And you act every single day that is your goal. And you think about it. Yeah. Yeah, kind of all along the idea that science happens, but also PIs yeah, and labs happen. Yeah. So how what can a candidate do and also how does a committee view them if your pathway hasn't been so linear and you know maybe PI yeah. leaves or has to move institutions and obviously that alters productivity and when you're comparing two candidates and one has had circumstance and the other one hasn't and they probably look better, but it might be, you know, a good one person. How do you guys wait through that? Or what can we do? I, I, so for you, on your end, I would definitely explain that in the cover letter, okay? Um, don't leave anything to assumption, and don't leave anything to non-explanation, because if you don't explain it somewhere, then people jump to all kinds of conclusions, right? Because they, they'll fill it in, right, with their own conclusion. So you want to explain what happened in a very professional way. I, I have lots of respect for that because it shows tenacity, Okay, it shows resilience, and it shows work ethic. And if everything works for you, if everything you touch turns to gold, 
and you come in here and you wake up in your big new empty lab, uh, how much resilience do you have? Because things aren't going to work. Let's, let's face it, nine tenths of what we do doesn't work, right? And especially when you're a brand new assistant professor, you're going to be up against the wall. So evidence of people really working through something, having the tenacity and the resilience, that scores high in my book. But you, so you want to explain it as well as you can. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We'll get to that. Um, so, how do you treat uh, candidates that are coming from research, research transitions? Do you treat them differently than uh, postdocs? No. No. For at Michigan, you can only be a postdoc for five years, and then you have to become a research investigator. It's fine. It's fine. I mean, um, we have had people that have transitioned to the tenure track from the research track, and we've hired. And no, it's really that continued record of productivity and then getting more and more independent as you go. So is there a duration of postdoctoral training or um, the duration of training that would be too much, that you would be not suspicious about this candidate? You know, it would be a little weird in the CV that, you know. Yeah, I mean, so, sometimes people just keep on they, they almost become professional postdocs. You know, they just keep on and on and on in that position and transition from one uh, research position to the next without and without demonstrating any kind of independence. And then you worry about that. But if that person is really striving and trying to get their own funding and trying to become uh, a senior uh, author, right, or and that that. I have a lot of respect for that because it's very difficult to get jobs today and it takes longer than it used to. So I no, I don't think so, but you have to keep demonstrating that impact. Okay? Okay. Yeah. How tolerant do you think this university would be of some someone as a postdoc trying to write an R one or R three? So you can't because you're a postdoc. So what Will did was he brokered a deal with his PI that, that if that they would promote him to the first rung of the research track mm -hmm. so he could submit this R01. And they did, and he did, and he got it. Okay? okay? You have to be in a faculty track to submit an R grant to NIH. Okay? You can't do it as a postdoc. So you have to broker some arrangement. Okay? You have to be promoted to at least research investigator. Okay. Is that for to achieve or not? No. So you can only be a postdoc here for five years. That's the law. And then you either you have to transition on to another place or you have to be promoted to research investigator, which is the first rung of the research faculty track. And that is done at the level of the department. Okay, that doesn't go to the provost or anything. It's at the level of the chair. So you, you can do that. So you would get to your point where you would like, all right, has this idea, we can write it. So it gives me more of a thing where you have to convince the department chair and your PI for the promotion, or just more your PI? Your PI. It really has to come from your PI to go to the chair and say, okay. this person is really ready to become a research investigator, and she's been productive as a postdoc, and this is really for the next this first independent step. And then the thing is, at NIH, NIH study sections are going to be very suspicious of our O1s and R21s that are coming from research faculty because they say, like from my own research faculty, this is money for Lori's lab, right? Why shouldn't we give it to her? And so you have to be very, very convincing. And Will was evidently very, very convincing and of his independence, and he got it. So it can be done. Okay. Yeah. Well, I didn't know, like, some places have more the attitude of, you know, that's for only the PIs, and if you're not a PI, you're not going to be able to Put it well, you can submit a grant anytime you want. That's that's up to you to right. submit but a grant. There is some sort of institutional support yeah, the sign on the section to it. Right. So I have to sign off on all grants that come out of pharmacology, and then they actually are submitted by the regents of the University of Michigan. So that's submitted by the medical school, right? Right. But if that's a that's a good grant and your chair signs off on it, that's going. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? I yeah, I want to go back to about the research statement. So as a chair, how much do you expect it to rate? Like two papers, 
three pages, like a mini proposal. Oh, yeah, that's could a good you start, question. Could you okay. that question? Yeah, yeah, so for the research yeah. statement, yeah. how long should it be and basically what should be in there, yeah. right? Okay, so you don't want it to be too long because people, you've got a search committee that's reading a lot of them. So you want it to be compelling and relatively short, like a couple of pages, okay? And in there, you want to start out by saying, these, these are the highlights of what I have done as a postdoc or a junior faculty member, but then you really want to transition as quickly as possible to this is what I would do. If you have a K99, that's easy. You put it right in there, and you talk about how you transition that to an ROO, an R01, um, but if you don't have that, you can still do the same thing, right? This is this is the hypothesis that I'd really like to focus on, and this is how I would uh, establish my independence. Okay, there, and then really, what's going to come down to it is what you say, right? What what you say when you're thinking on your feet in your chalk talk is what's going to really matter. Okay. Okay, so maybe one or two more questions? Yeah. I don't have to be up there until 11, so if we go over, we're fine. All right. I guess, um, so one of, the, we covered CVs in the research statement just now, uh, the, the cover letter itself was also a common one. Is there any kind of do's and don'ts for the cover letter, just generally, specifically? I've seen all kinds, and you know, it, it's just a it's a pleasantry that opens mm -hmm. the door. Don't put anything in there. I've seen some things that are not politically very good, where people will say things about that implies something about their former or their PI, their former PI. Like if there were special circumstances, and somebody asked me about that, about transitioning, you know, from place to place, or something happened. And sometimes people put statements in those letters that they should have put in there. So never do that because science is a very small world. So, but what that does is it's, it reflects more on you than the, than the statement you're making, right? That this is something that maybe you don't want that person in your department. So just be careful of what you say and just be really forward and say, just put yourself out there and that I know that I could be a good fit in your department because. Mm -hmm. Okay. And any last words of advice or something that while you were in this process yourself, you wish you would have known? Yeah, let's see. Um, I think the most important thing you can do is practice your chalk talk and go to chalk talks because that's one of the most important things you're ever going to do when it's a trial by fire. You don't want it to be, you don't want to be standing up here with the whole department and you think, oh wow, I've never done this before. So think about it, practice it. Um, what else? And really think about, you make a lot of mistakes when you're a new assistant professor and the biggest mistakes you make are hiring your own, because now you're hiring and bringing trainees and your lab director and your technicians into your, in your lab. Because the temptation is, you've got this big, now empty lab with nobody in it, and you're tempted to fill it. And as a new assistant professor, you're not gonna get stellar postdoctoral candidates knocking at your door to come in. You're gonna get people that really are having trouble finding anything. And so my advice to you is, it's bigger to, it's better to have a big empty echo chamber of a lab than to have the wrong person in it, okay? I hired a postdoc a long time ago that I didn't want to come to work just because this person was so unpleasant. And then you have to deal with getting rid of that person, right? And that is really hard. So get the advice of your chair, your, Find mentors, find people that no matter what they say to do, other senior people, that whatever they say to do, you do it and it works. Find them, identify those mentors, and then go to them and say, should I hire this person to fill your lab with the key people? Because that will make or break you.